So in the last segment, I talked some about um, the, the jazz age and the element of the lost generation, of liberation, of seeing this decade as an expression both of the cynicism that came from or came out of the First World War and uh, an expression of, of new rights and new opportunities and new independence for various groups. Uh, some ways African Americans, certainly culturally, um, but also for women, for youth. And, and I do think all those are elements of the so-called jazz age in the 1920s. But there's another side still, and it's about this, you might say, a, a bit of a darker side that uh, it's about this darker side I want to talk about in this segment um, and sort of counterpose against this new liberation. We'll see how it goes. You may recall from previous segments and previous lectures by 1919-1920, there was a considerable amount of fear in the United States on the heels of the First World War, growing out of this sentiment that had been built up during the war of 100% Americanism, of this sort of pure patriotism. That aspect of the war, which was a limiting aspect, which was designed to curtail uh, freedom of speech, which was designed to focus people's attention on supporting and the mobilization for war and the carrying out of war and war aims of the United States during the First World War. Remnants of that approach, remnants of that effort will, I think, last into the 1920s. And that's to some extent where the counter to this liberation or independence sort of thinking, it's where it's to be found in the 1920s. But I think you also have far more long-standing issues that, again, play out in the 1920s. One of them that I want to mention, besides the sort of fear of radicalism and unionization and those kind of things, is race. Race seems to always be present in American history. And I mentioned in an earlier lecture and I hope you recall the degree to which we have massive demographic shifts going on in the United States in the 19-teens in particular that will continue, I think, into the 1920s that moved through the First World War that pulled uh, people away from rural areas, um, particularly in the South, to opportunities that came to exist in towns and cities where you had industry and manufacturing employment. And that created a great deal of tension in those communities, particularly when it came to matters of race, where race, large numbers, for instance, of African Americans were thrust into localities that had traditionally been very much dominated by white population. And you can think of Chicago and, um, even Knoxville, Tennessee is a pretty decent example of race riots that occurred just on the heels of the First World War. But race is not new to the United States as, as an issue. And it's race in part that will play out in the 1920s. It'll still be there in this new cultural situation. Well, I want to start by talking about something called nativism. And nativism is predominantly drawn from, of course, the rejection or fear of the effects of immigration. It's tied to, uh, usually tied to the interests of a predominant group defined ethnically or racially that want to resist the change that maybe in the offing as a result of demographic shifts, cultural shifts, and of course, those were very much going on in the 1920s. During the war, if you go back to World War I, remember that there was considerable fear of espionage, of saboteurs, um, and of populations that perhaps came from Europe or other 
places that might undermine America's dedication to the First World War and the war effort. In 1921, partly out of this fear of ethnicity, but also radicalism, again, people who've talked about like anarchists and socialists and even communists, in 1921, Congress passed an Emergency Immigration Act. Immigration into this country was not to exceed 3% of the nationality already in the United States, according to the 1910 census. Well, what that means is, to put another way, that the United States uh, in 1921 passed sort of emergency legislation which set or established a basis for future immigration that was tied to the numbers of people who had been in the United States in 1910. It's very much a conservative measure that seeks to hold back new immigration, limit new immigration. And it's, it's fascinating, it's interesting, and I, if I haven't, I should have pointed this out already, the degree to which issues of immigration, particularly apply to the United States and have been important to U.S. history, of course, going all the way back to the early, um, the early, earliest of uh, parties, political parties with the Democratic Republicans and the Federalists and the so-called Alien and Sedition Acts. Uh, but that's for an entirely other course. We, I'll, I, I need to stop digressing, I suppose. Well, in 1924, um, Congress followed up with a more measured act, when they had more time to think about, known as the Johnson-Reed Act or sometimes the National Origins Act, 1924, the National Origins Act. This act, 1924, banned immigration from East Asia entirely. Notice that it's focused not so much on Europe but it's focused very much on Asia and immigration from Asia. The very areas, you may recall, that the United States had expanded into in terms of Pacific expansion during the Spanish-American War. But then it went on to reduce European quotas again as well. Whereas the previous legislation in 1921 had shifted the standard back to 1910, the legislation in 1924 set the European quota at between 3 or 2%, 3 to 2% of the levels, the levels of different ethnicities or groupings in the 1890 census. So we've gone, instead of using 1910 as the measuring stick for deciding how many immigrants will be allowed into the U.S., the National Origins Act or the Johnson Act pushes it back to 1890 as the standard. This nativism is bound up with larger issues of race that are affecting people because of the demographic shifts occurring within the United States as well. So that one of the things we see in the 1920s, and I think it's reflective of this, this fear, a larger fear uh, in the U.S., but one of the things we see is the reemergence, full blown, of the old Ku Klux Klan. Now, the story of the Klan really goes back to the war years. In 1915, going back a ways, the Klan was reborn, uh, the product in large part of a fellow named William J. Simmons, who was a part time evangelist and a salesman in Georgia who created or recreated, or I guess created is a better word, this new 1920s Klan, World War I era Klan, uh, at Stone Mountain, Georgia, just outside Atlanta. As part of, the, part of the deal, Simmons will revive the hoods and the cloaks and the sort of paraphernalia of the Klan. It's, it's, structure, its hierarchy of offices, titles. But I think one thing I want to go ahead and say sets the new clan apart in a big way. One thing is the, its recognition. And remember, remember that Simmons is very much tied in with business. Well, he's going to be tied in with the new business methods. In, in many ways, this new clan is a business. It's, it's very much tied to fundraising and money and sales. <clears throat> 
but it's also tied to marketing. And the secrecy element is one mechanism of marketing, right? That you can, you can have something, a possession, you can consume something that not everyone is going to have access to. You're special somehow. You're buying that specialness. And Simmons and his cohorts made it a point to sell robes, to sell paraphernalia, often through the mail. Also literature, clan literature that was written, the, the very structures or rituals of the clan were sold so that new chapters could purchase those rituals and have them uh, for their own practices. The second major thing I'd like to suggest about this new clan is the degree to which it is different or distinct from the earlier Reconstruction clan. Um, the Reconstruction clan, from my perspective, was more than willing to use violence for political ends. Now, it was directed against race, uh, in particular against African Americans in the South, but it was also directed against whites, and particularly those whites who assisted African Americans or who were aligned with the Republican Party in the South. The new Klan of the 1920s will be a much more expansive Klan in terms of its disdain for a wider array of people and ideas. It's also, I would argue, while it's political, it's also very much cultural. So that this new Klan is not merely a Southern phenomenon, but indeed it is a national phenomenon. We will see the Klan emerging not only in Tennessee, but in places like Oregon, in Indiana, um, it'll be out in Texas, um, across the South, but far more broadly. And I've got some images that I, I like to show in a lecture of a 1926 parade in Washington, D.C., where you have a parade of the Ku Klux Klan, and you actually have clans or chapters, uh, claverns, uh, represented with their big banners and they're, they're walking down the avenue with these banners from places like Vermont. Um, this is not the Reconstruction Klan by any means. This is a product of the early 20th century. So it spreads especially strongly into these new industrial areas where you have whites from the South, but you also have African Americans moving in from the South looking for employment. That is, uh, ex it, it blows up even more as you see these race riots occurring right after the war where you've had massive numbers of immigrants moving in and the tensions are high. By 1923, this new Klan, which focused not merely on African Americans, but on immigrants, on Jews, on Catholics, this new Klan, 1923, reported 3 million members. 1924, that number had gone up to about 4 million members. Now, I've mentioned several groups, right? But understand that, and this is something else I think to understand about this Klan, it was often seen even as, it, even as it threatened violence, it was often seen by whites who could become members, even middle class whites, certainly working class whites or lower class whites, it was seen as a civic organization preserving sort of that 100% Americanism, that purity. That ties it back to the war years, but the rhetoric is of the war years. I think the sentiment ties this Klan very much to this kind of changing climate in the United States, the threat to change, the threat to the old ideas. So that this new Klan pits itself not only against change, but against populations, immigration that are moving into the U.S., the cultural change. And that's why, in addition to ethnicities, this Klan will promote itself as a preserver of moral order and go after um, whites who appear to be irreligious, uh, who appear to espouse ideas that, you know, they think, the Klan thinks, threaten the moral order. Uh, drunkenness in the midst of prohibition, 
And I don't want to take this argument too far, but I think it's worth considering. It's a, it's a really fascinating question. By upholding things like prohibition, by expressing this larger fear of radicalism and a fear of immigration, and expressing through its actions a certain level of, of racism, there are, I think, and I think we could argue, there are remnants of sort of some progressive ideals in the Klan. Now remember, progressivism itself had a conservative element about it. And so one, one of the points I think historians might debate is the degree to which in the 1920s you have the remnants of this broader progressivism. And is that then expressed in sort of, is it expressed in the radical demands of women, if they are so radical? Or is that progressive spirit best expressed in the conservative ideas of an organization that's civic-minded, that seeks to, 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 to implant and preserve a certain moral order that's very filled with middle-class values? Is that clan, that reactionary or conservative force, more in keeping with this earlier progressive spirit? Well, I don't know. I, I'm just going to bring that up and, and, you know, think about it. It's something that I think historians need to think about. We do think about. You need to think about in thinking about the 1920s. But I wanted to bring that to your attention. One of the um, key figures in the new clan, and I have a, a photograph that I often use in lecture that shows uh, one of shows this clan leader, a fellow by the name of Hiram Evans. Evans uh, was a dentist in Texas. In 1922, he became the Imperial Wizard. And he developed this plan that would bring the Klan to political prominence um, in state politics. So that by the mid-1920s in states like Indiana, uh, Illinois, and, and others, you had Klansmen moving up into state legislatures and in at least one instance, certainly to the governorship, that's fairly impressive. It shows an organizational ability, a political idea at work, but it also would turn out to be one of the, one of the events, one of the achievements that undermines and sort of destroys the 1920s clan. I mean, it's never fully destroyed, but it, it sure does destroy its image. 1925, uh, Indiana Grand Dragon David Stevenson allegedly kidnapped and raped his secretary while on a train. This young lady who was severely injured died from her injuries or partly as a result of the atrocities committed, um, she determined to commit suicide. Stevenson was ultimately convicted of second degree murder and his fall from grace um, subsequently began to bring attention to corruption and violence and criminal activity committed by other members of the Klan an organization which prided itself, which promoted itself as a defender of women's purity and law and order. The publicity really put the entire clan into a bad light. I have a, a letter that I often use and I think it speaks volumes about the Klan and about the 1920s. It's written, um, the, the head, header on the letter is Women of the Ku Klux Klan, Incorporated, 
and I want to emphasize that it's women of the Ku Klux Klan. And that really does tell you the degree to which women, even in this new era of independence, many women still held quite conservative ideas. Um, anyway, this is from the, the women, sort of a women's auxiliary to the Klan from Alliance, Ohio, not Mississippi or Georgia or Alabama or Tennessee, not even Oklahoma or Texas, but from Ohio. It's a state you might not expect. And let me just very quickly, it's written to President Calvin Coolidge. It says, Honored Sir, we, the women of the Ku Klux Klan of Alliance, Ohio, do so heartily approve the Johnson Immigration Bill. So overwhelmingly passed by House and Senate. And we earnestly request that you, the President of this United States, give your support and affix your signature, signature sorry, to this bill. We shall ever be devoted to the sublime principles of a pure Americanism and valiant in the defense of its ideals and institutions. It is our earnest desire to promote real patriotism toward our civil government, honorable peace among men and nations, and protection for and happiness in the homes of our people. Sincerely, Alliance Clan Number 1, Women of the Ku Klux Klan. And again, women in the Klan, an Ohio chapter of the Klan, really writing in support of the National Origins Act. I think the letter sort of nicely ties up several of the loose ends. But it wasn't just in terms of nativism that we see this conservative response, this, well, conservative response isn't bad, but we see this reaction um, that draws on this older tradition to the cultural questioning, the challenge that, that's going on in the 20s. We've talked a bit about passage of the 18th Amendment and the Volstead Act. Um, understand that throughout the 20s, there was a continued resistance to alcohol, to the saloon, which was so intimately tied to immigration and to cultures of Europe in particular. Um, but it will lead in the 1920s to the rise of gangsters who are making fortunes off of selling illegal alcohol, uh, also entering into drugs, the sale of drugs, gambling, prostitution, many of the vices that the progressives had sought to wipe away, to uh, rid uh, the United States of. This is a problem for Americans. Um, the violence that ensues in places like Chicago as a result with um, Al Capone, and most of you probably have heard of or are familiar with uh, Al Capone, one of the better known, or I guess best known of the, of the leaders uh, of the gangsters, you know, understand that the independence that's tied to alcohol in the 20s is bound up with illegal activity and, and groups like the Klan, but also civic-minded groups, old line progressives who had fought long and hard for prohibition see this violence and they see ethnicity and they see the new, more liberal culture as very much linked. And so it makes sense that they would sort of strike out against it. They would seek to impose law and order. It complicates the 20s in major ways. But it's intriguing that prohibition in particular is one of those areas that the United States government is fundam fundamentally involved with. Remember that when Al Capone is taken down, uh, when he finally goes to jail, it's over the failure to pay taxes. It is the Internal Revenue Service and Department of Justice and Treasury and alcohol, tobacco, and firearms and such that are intimately involved um, with his uh, 
ultimate imprisonment. The role of government is still present. Often, remember back to when we talked about Hoover and Coolidge and Harding, often it's out of the way. It's not activist. But that doesn't mean it's a government that doesn't have goals, that it doesn't back certain groups, that it doesn't operate on their behalf. The last sort of example I want to talk about, and there are so many more, we could talk about the final trial of Sacco and Benzetti. Uh, they've been mentioned, I know, in a previous lecture. But I want to talk about the so-called Scopes trial. By 1921, we had seen the emergence of new groups within American Protestantism, a schism that really went back to the late 19th century and arguably even further, had developed really over issues of interpretation of scripture. On the one hand, you had the more liberal traditions um, sort of more mainline in a way, traditions of Protestant, uh, Protestantism or Protestant Christianity, I suppose would be the best way to say it. But you were beginning to see in the late 19th century a sort of move away from this direction of liberalizing Christianity, Protestant Christianity, and incorporating elements of critical biblical studies as well as science. And then this new movement was moving away from that direction and really beginning to emphasize certain what they might have called fundamentals. A basic understanding of scripture and for instance its inerrancy. The idea that the Bible, for instance, as written, was written as intended, without error, regardless of how that scripture may have contradicted scientific knowledge. So written without error. And this emergent fundamentalism was taking in the early 20th century, I think, an ever sort of larger role uh, within or among, say, evangelicals. Uh, they could agree with these fundamental beliefs that there are just certain core beliefs at the heart of Christianity which can't be surrendered, say, to the more modern interpretations that were really emerging and coming to the fore. Now, from my perspective, what happens with this Scopes trial that we're going to talk about in just a second requires a little more complication than that. And I'll sort of explain as we go, but understand I want you to listen for this sort of religious complication that I want to throw in. Biblical inerrancy was intimately tied to the preservation of certain central elements of society. It's not just biblical in the sense of it's not just about scripture, it is about how one lives and how one ought to live. The fear, I think, that is expressed in fundamentalism here is reflective of that larger fear of changing culture, of threats to the existing culture and cultural norms. By the mid-1920s, fundamentalism is beginning to affect American politics. It's beginning to influence political decision makers who are looking to constituents. And this is particularly true in the American South, the U.S. South. Well, in March 1925, March of 1925, Legislators in the state of Tennessee will pass a law known as the Butler Act that will make it illegal for any public school teacher 
to, and I quote, teach any theory that denies the story of the divine creation of man as taught in the Bible, end quote. Now, an organization, the American Civil Liberties Union, and by the way, this was a law passed in Tennessee, but there were laws being passed in other states as well. It wasn't just an issue in Tennessee, okay? An organization known as the American Civil Liberties Union, or the ACLU, placed advertisements in newspapers around the country, including Tennessee, offering to handle the charges for the defense of anyone who was willing to break the law in order to test one of these evolution laws. The story then moves, the story then moves to a little town in Tennessee called Dayton, D-A-Y-T-O-N, Dayton, Tennessee. In Dayton, There was a young school teacher, 24 years old. He was a tennis coach. His name was John T. Scopes. And he ended up having himself arrested or agreeing to be arrested for actions that he had undertaken while substituting in a biology class. He agreed that he had most likely taught elements of evolutionary theory while he was teaching this class, this biology class. Now that brings us to another point that needs to be made, and that's evolution. Evolution as a concept in biology, we generally refer back to uh, Charles Darwin, Origins of Species, and it posits, Darwin posits, that biological creatures experience mutation, natural, natural mutation, and that this mutation over time leads to the creation, in part as a result of environment and the interaction of mutation with environment, leads to changes that ultimately lead to the creation of new species. So that what Darwin is suggesting is a scientific theory, well, it becomes accepted science, but initially, let's say as a theory, is that the animals we see around us and the animals that have existed have over time evolved, that they have mutated and survived the environment to reproduce allowing more mutations to occur. This is a process called natural selection, where those who survive live to reproduce while others of their species are selected out. It's rather a happenstance affair when you think about it. Who lives and who dies may be a matter of luck, but generally those with a, one mutation may have an advantage while those without may lack that advantage. It's common knowledge. I don't think I have to go into great depth. Not sure I could. I'm not a biologist, but it's pretty common knowledge how that works. But the emergence of Darwin's ideas, as you might imagine, place science, especially biology, even things like animal science, on a course of collision with this new expression of fundamentalism. Science, tradition, right? You can see it coming. And it just so happens that it comes in this little town of Dayton, Tennessee, where John Scopes happens to be teaching a biology course and where the ACLU has agreed to pay for a defense. The ACLU sent one of the most able lawyers in the United States to defend Scopes. His name was Clarence Darrow. For the prosecution, one of our old friends, William Jennings Bryan, steps in. William Jennings Bryan, I mean, think about it. Bryan, the candidate of 96, the cross of gold, the fighter for the little man. 
the working man, the farmer, the anti-imperialist candidate in 1900, a man who resigned from Woodrow Wilson's cabinet over Wilson's effort to go to war. And here he shows up for what turns out to be rather a last hurrah to prosecute or assist with the prosecution of this young teacher over the issue of evolution having been taught in a public school. Well, Dayton, Tennessee, 1925, becomes a veritable circus. And a lot of the jocularity, a lot of the uh, efforts at humor are sort of making fun of this notion that man should come from the monkey. A kind of broad and really in inappropriate and improper interpretation of evolution. But you have monkey grinders, you have people selling monkey dolls, you have as well, you know, you have your vendors selling snacks and it's hot, it's the summer when this court case is held, they're selling lemonade, cold water, they're also selling mineral drinks. The press comes from all over the country. They come from Baltimore. They come from New York. And one of the most fascinating things is that WGN out of Chicago, WGN radio at the time, has microphones present for this case. The mass media, the new technology, the fascination with, well, with consumption and lo and behold, this little case in Dayton, Tennessee, becomes a national spectacle. Remember, this is the same era when college students are watching college football in mass. They're watching college sports, spectator sports. Consumers. Americans consume this cultural conflict in Dayton. Now, it's really not that big a deal. I'm not a huge fan of the play Inherit the Wind. Many of you have probably seen or read that. Maybe even seen the movie. It's a fine movie. But I, just, I do think it caricatures both Darrow and Brian. And really the whole trial in a way. Because as with most things, what happens in Dayton is more complicated than that. It is true that Darrow called William Jennings Bryan as a witness. It is true that it got so hot, the case, the, the trial was taken outside. It was held outside. The crowds were so large. The heat was so bad. It is true that the judge in the case restricted what Darrow was able to do, his calling of experts. And so he calls Bryan to the stand as an expert and they have probably one of the greatest exchanges during the trial in, in sort of legal history, certainly one of the most unusual. Brian appears as an expert on the Bible, right? Not as the longtime politician or anything else, but as an expert on the Bible. And I think there is a touch of ego there in his willingness to do that. Darrow does manage to fluster Brian on the stand over issues of interpretation of Scripture. And Brian is put in a bad spot, a spot from which he feels he must recover in terms of his own image. But it's all really rather moot. The key question in the trial, and the way the judge in the trial ultimately brings it all back around, is whether or not Scopes taught evolution and thereby broke Tennessee law. I think Darrow recognized that. He saw this court case as an opportunity to take the issue of state laws like the Butler Act to the Supreme Court. Scopes was found guilty and eventually he paid a small fine that didn't settle anything about evolution or fundamentalism. It embarrassed Brian who died shortly after the trial But what does it mean? Well, there are two things I'd like to tell you that you don't often hear about the Scopes trial. The first is that the business of America was business. 
Understand that when Scopes got involved in this, he had been called down to a drugstore in Dayton by a number of the leading businessmen to determine whether he had not, had or had not actually taught evolution. And he wasn't entirely sure, but their purpose was they'd seen the ACLU advertisement, if I remember correctly, it was in a Chattanooga paper, and they saw this advertisement and the possibility of national attention as something worthy of pursuing primarily to get Dayton on the map. They saw a possibility of getting national attention that might lead to investment and lead to jobs. And that seems to me to complicate this whole matter just a bit. It does lend itself to that circus atmosphere, but it's also about spectacle. It's about advertising. It's about business and opportunity. It's about affluence. The second point that I would make, and it's not something I've answered for myself just yet, but it does go to why William Jennings Bryan shows up in Dayton, Tennessee. And I guess where I've come to I need to think more about it, but I want to give you this and let you think about it and decide what you think. William Jennings Bryan was for a long time a social crusader. A crusader for what he considered social justice, and that's why he was a crusader sort of in his own mind, as much as he was egotistical, a crusader for the little man. He was a defender of the people. I think, I think that's how Bryan often saw himself and how he wanted to be seen. So you're asking yourself, well, what does that have to do with evolution? I think it has this to do with evolution. Remember how I said the Jazz Age was complicated, that in many ways the liberation flowed from the cynicism? Well, let me suggest that Brian's presence in Dayton was William Jennings Bryan dealing with the cynicism. I suspect that Brian here is thinking very much about what he had seen in World War I, which was the death of millions of young men in the trenches of Europe. I don't mean seen personally, but you know what, what the world had seen. How do you kill that many people? Well, arguably, you have to dehumanize them. You can't think of them as individuals. You can't think of them as, as people. Rather, you have to abstract them. You have to think of them as a group. I'm not killing an individual. I'm killing a Hun or I'm killing a Brit. When you think back to World War I and the posters that were produced to help build American patriotism, to help Americans think about the war as a crusade of sorts against criminal behavior, against violence, against everything that was dark in the world. You come to understand the degree to which war of the type we see in World War I necessitates dehumanizing the enemy. For for William Jennings Bryan, and this is not in any way a detraction from evolution, it's a scientific idea, but I think for William Jennings Bryan, at least, when he saw evolution, when he thought about evolution, he thought about the potential then for the dehumanization of people, of humanity. Now, what that means, what that means is that Brian, this longtime crusader for social justice, perhaps, I'd like to at least leave you with this, thought of Dayton as another stand for social justice, for hindering people in positions of power, the elite, the educated, whomever, from merely considering they were often categorized as country bumpkins, considering these people of Dayton 
or people of Tennessee as less than human. It's not for me to say who's right. It's not for me to come down on evolution, which I think makes perfect sense as science. But like with the Jazz Age, I don't want to leave you with some simple idea about the events at Dayton or the era, the, the, the decade. I want it to be complicated. And I want this period, so important to American history and understanding the emergence of the religious right politically later on, so important to understanding America's scientific basis later on. I want you to understand that it was complicated.